having specialised in navigation and having been promoted to squadron leader, I was selected to help get developed the type of instrument that we needed in the service to do our job. In particular, those associated with navigation and the bombing of uh, targets, uh, enemy targets. Harry Pritchard and I together formed the new navigation section. Harry Pritchard was a brilliant chap, brilliant scientist, and he and I got on like a house on fire. Our boss was a chap named Jack Richards, who went out of his way to make me a good friend of his. He told me whenever I wanted anything to go to him directly and things would be done. He mentioned to me that his wife was ill and was going to have an operation back in Wales, and um, would it be possible for me perhaps to put him up for a few days? And I agreed, and Bunny, I had a way with my wife, he was delighted to have him. So he came to stay with us, and that was a real eye-opener. Every night he tried to convert me to communism, he told me the story of his family. Part of the family had died of starvation. His father had been a miner who was out of work. He himself nearly died of starvation when young, whereas down the road from them, uh, so whoever it was, was hunting, shooting and fishing and enjoying life with plenty of money. And he believed that the communist system was the only thing to save the world. This went on all the week. Now, in the service, we were not allowed normally ever to discuss two things, religion and politics. And so to me, this was a very strange situation. After he had left, I mentioned this to Pritchard. And I said, the chap a bloody communist. And Pritchard said, oh, Tubby, didn't you know? He and Locke Spicer and Meredith, three chaps, were the ringleaders in 1926 of the riots here at uh, Farnborough. Well, I remember the great, the, uh, the, the big uh, um, strike of 1926, but I hadn't realised that. He said, oh, yes, they're on the Russian side and doing everything they can to stop things being properly developed. And if they are developed, to make damn sure that they won't work properly. This was so startling to me that I could barely believe it. But when I looked at what was happening there at Farnborough, it was absolutely clear that Richards was working on behalf of the Soviets. Meredith, who had been head of the department before Jack Richards had taken over and was now head of Smith's Instruments and Lockspicer, who became Sir Ben Lockspicer, was at headquarters. Those three between them were responsible for the inefficiency of Bunham Command in being able to win the war much earlier than we actually did. One or two people realised what was going on, but of course Richard reported direct uh, to, uh, admittedly there was the superintendent, but he reported direct to uh, the, the Ministry of Supply where he had his other uh, communists uh, in very senior positions, such that it would have been not been good for anyone's future career to d say anything against Richard or against uh, the communists. I attended a big meeting chaired by Richard as to whether we would adopt the Sperry autopilot or continue with the awful model that uh, Richards had uh, originated some many years before. We all recommended most strongly that we should adopt immediately the Sperry, which I tested thoroughly and was brilliant, and the ruling 
came from the headquarters later on that we were to continue developing and using and fitting the English version, the RE version of that. And that was the most damning thing that I ever knew of in writing that could perhaps even be turned up now, the minutes of that meeting, to show that uh, Richard was deliberately stopping the Air Force from being efficient. And what justification did they give? Oh, he produced a question of cost and future maintenance and uh, efficiency. He claimed that it was more efficient than the Sperry one, which all the pilots knew was nonsense. And um, it was backed up by um, his pals in, in the headquarters in London. When Germany invaded Russia, the whole thing changed. Richards immediately became an efficient chap at trying to get us the right equipment to do the job. After the war, that reversed again. High-level bombers were out. It had to be. The only way of getting through was either with a rocket, which went right up and right down very quickly, uh, like the German V2, or a low-level bomber flying fast, which meant that he could not drop the bomb without him blowing himself up. Therefore, that the bomb had to have projection a propulsion to get it away from the aircraft and therefore needed navigation, a device inside it, to navigate it from where the aircraft dropped it. I therefore decided that the easiest way to do the whole thing was to arrange that the aircraft would get fly over a well-known object, an easily found object, like the um, branch of a river or a big railway crossing or something like that that he could easily distinguish uh, and uh, uh, fly over that, release the bomb uh, and while he flew off in one direction the bomb would go in the other direction to the target and it needed something to navigate it that short distance. I got together with one of the uh, scientists, uh, Dr uh, Adams, and we did calculations on the accuracy of gyros and we found that it was quite possible, quite cheaply and quite easily to provide the propulsion and the guidance inside a bomb for 10 to 20 miles. This became the VL bombing system. Well, I used to have red cheeks and it got the code name, the official code name, of Red Cheeks. It was arranged that Group Captain VL would go to Washington with the Chief of the Air Staff to assist him in proposing this to the um, United States Air Force and US Navy. The job was given to the Chief of Strategic Command, General Curtis LeMay. He sat back and said, Right, VL, I buy it. What do you want? And I had carte blanche to do anything I like to get this quickly proven. The idea was originally that it would be about perhaps 10 to 15 miles maximum range. But as the navigation equipment inside, as we could improve that, so the range at which it could be done would lengthen until eventually we hoped that we could send it just with a propelled bomb from land in America to the middle of Russia. Now, by that time, Jack Richards was head of RRE at Morven, that is the radar establishment at Morven. And uh, I got no cooperation from him whatsoever. And every possible obstacle was put in my path by him. At the end of that year, I told the uh, Americans and the chief of staff, chief of air staff, that the system was proven to my satisfaction, and that now it was a matter really of it going into production, 
designing it in detail and producing it and adopting it. And with the view, in my, my view, that it completely changed the whole of warfare from then on to make bombing very accurate and make the threat of an atomic bomb through the window such that it might well prevent wars. There was a meeting to be held at the end of that year. Unfortunately, meanwhile, the superintendent at Farnborough, under whom nominally I was working, uh, died. He had been most cooperative and everything gone well. And in his place came a chap I knew for more time, Sir Arnold Hall, and a rather a conceited little chap, clever, no doubt about it, and he was posted in as superintendent of Farnborough. Richard had called a meeting which concerned Red Cheeks very much and had excluded me individually from attending. I rebelled and said I wasn't tolerating that sort of treatment. I went to the new superintendent, not realising that he was a communist too, and he took the side of Richards and demanded that I should be, that uh, uh, RAE should be relieved of my presence, that I should be posted away immediately, and the whole project dropped. And it was 